Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are back with our friend, Paul Wells. Paul, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Bart. It's great to be back. Thank you. Yeah, man. The The series continues. Um, mm-hmm. We've we've had a bit of a time gap here between recording because you were in you were in Europe, correct? I I was, yeah. I I had a well, gosh, I mean, a few trips around the United States, and then yeah, a couple weeks in Europe. Um, three gigs in Germany, and then a a, a gig in the UK in uh, Southampton, and then a, a full week at Ronnie Scott's in London, and that was all with wow. Curtis Steigers. So, uh, it's been busy, and then straight back home and into doing busy stuff here too. So it's been, it's been a lot and um, I'm trying to get my head back into the Tony Williams game right now. Exactly. So, um, all right, Paul, so we're jumping back in here with part two. If people haven't seen part one, you know, the old saying, we obviously we recommend you go and check that out. But if you're interested uh, in more of this period of Tony's life, then maybe this is something you can jump in uh, here. It's, but, it's interesting you mentioned that because there are different kind of, I mean, there are people, most people love all of Tony Williams output, but, but there's definitely kind of like a, uh, I guess almost a, was it a demarcation? Um, there, there, there are certain musicians, t- typically, um, more jazz oriented players, um, that prefer sixties Tony. Um, yeah. and even within that, there are some that really prefer 63, 64 when he was kind of more bebop language um oriented 65 he started to change his playing started to become more open um less kind of like you know phrases um box like i guess the 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 song forms changed they stopped using things that were based a little more around uh um the great american songbook type song form so his playing opened up and some people like that period um, and then there are also people that love the early 70s, the Lifetime, the first Lifetime band. Um, and then there are other people, particularly a lot of rock drummers, that kind of pick up with this period around 75, around the time that the album Believe It comes out, um, which is a, a massively important record, a very, very important fusion and rock record, I think. And and this is the kind of like when you think of drummers like um like Vinnie Kaliuta and um Dennis Chambers, Steve Smith, um uh, Gary Husband, like this is for me, this is the period of Tony that I think that they kind of like that's where their big influence comes from. It's sort of this this period. Big kit Tony, sure, you might say. And 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 um uh, so, so it could be totally viable for somebody to start up with this episode, actually. And and it was kind of a coincidence that we just got, you know, we were what like about twenty seven hours in <laughs> on uh, part one, and yeah. kind of realized like, okay, this might be a good place to stop right before the big kit era starts. Yeah. Um, so, it, but it actually, you know, as far as those different sort of groups of people that are into specific areas, maybe this makes sense. So. Yeah, Let's pick no, it that's up. a good. I'm I'm glad you said that because that's a good kind of like uh, uh, timeline of the eras of Tony, uh, yeah. which part one was basically his childhood, but really early '60s into about 1973, '74, and we're gonna pick it yeah. up today at 1975. Correct. Th- he actually, yeah, he he. Um, so the 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 stuff we ended with was this uh, film that just recently surfaced of Tony Williams in Africa, which apparently was filmed in 1973. And I think that he actually there was a period, kind of a hiatus period for him, where he sort of regrouped and kind of you know took some time off and took time away from touring and and um, maybe just kind of thought about what he wanted to do next. And and because believe it, in '75 is such a completely different statement than anything he had done and the drums change and a lot of things about his style change and yet at the same time it's the completely logical next point when you listen to everything leading up to it it makes perfect sense of course this is what he was going to do but yeah it is it's a very interesting time period and um he I mean, he had been doing electric music. He had been playing with electric bass players and playing with guitar players and playing louder music. But he had been doing it. The kit that he that you see him using in 71, 72 is still kind of a jazz kit. It's still uh, a small bass drum. It's still smaller toms, just a couple cymbals. Um, 
And this is the first period um, around the time Believe It comes out. Uh, 75, this is where you start to see some pictures of him with a bigger kit, what would really be a rock kit. Everything is bigger, um, bigger drums, um, bigger cymbals, more crash cymbals, you know, and uh, bigger hi-hats and bigger sticks too. He started using, um, well, I'll talk about sticks at a later point, um, but he actually had started using bigger sticks around 71 um, but at this point, it's like always two Bs. It's big sticks. He switches to the black dot heads. Again, I'll cover that later. But um, the first photo, the earliest photo that I could find. Now, there's a kit that you start to see in 76. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, but there are, some, there are a couple of photos that show what's to me sort of a prototype of this kit, like kind of a pre big kit, big kit. And if you look at the, um, there's a photo uh, that I have labeled uh, 1975 Keystone Corner. Um, and this is a photo, it's by uh, Tom Copy or Copy. Um, and this was published in Modern Drummer Magazine in 97 when Tony passed. They did a big tribute issue to him. And this is the only place I've ever seen this photo published. I believe that's taken at the Keystone Corner, that, that backdrop. Um, was kind of distinctive, and I'm pretty sure that's from that club. Now, this kit is interesting because it's clearly a big bass drum, and it's clearly two big toms, and um, but you still see two interesting things. Oh, you see the multiple crash symbols. You see a crash symbol in the middle between the, the two rack toms, and that's a first. That's the first time that he starts using that smaller crash symbol. Um, sort of in between the 18 on his left and the 22 ride. Um, but you also see um, an old, what, what would still would have been an old style Gretsch, kind of like the rail mount. Um, it, it's based on the rail mount. It's a double tom holder, but with the same sort of clip mount that you'd see on a rail. And um, I found that model number of it, if anybody is interested, um, it's the it's the 4936. So Gretsch assigned for every item that they made, whether it was like a snare drum or it was like a wing nut or something or um, a bongo. Everything in their catalog had a four digit number. And I think they all started with four. Um, you know, for example, like the, I, I mentioned the snare that he used um, most of the time in the 60s, the, the chrome over brass, the five and five by 14 chrome over brass, eight lug snare, it famously is called the 4160. Um, people refer to it as like, oh, you got a 4160. That's a great snare. Um, and it is a great snare. It's one of the, probably my favorite Gretsch snare. Um, and uh, I've owned one for years. It's a cool snare. And they all have this like, you know, 4160. That's like a number everybody knows. More obscure would be the 4936 double tom mount. <laughs> but that's what you see in this picture. Um, Slightly less famous of a uh, number. Possibly but... less iconic, yes. Yes. <laughs> Another interesting thing is that the later, all of his later kits are really well known for having a six and a half by 14 snare. He started using a deep snare. But in this photo, you see he's still using a five and a half by 14, possibly a five by 14. It's a little hard to tell. I think it's a five and a half um, Gretsch snare, wooden snare with this kit. So this is sort of an interesting, again, kind of an in-between because he always used a five and a half or yeah. a five um, previous to the big kit. And this is like a big kit, but with the shallower snare. Um, I can't tell from this photo how many floor toms he has. Um, but if we look at the next photo that I have, which is the back cover of the Believe It album, the, the, the LP, which I have a copy of it on LP. Um, it was actually hard to find a photo that really represented this. I looked around. I found tons and tons of reproductions of the back cover, but most of them were actually slightly cropped. And mm. if you zoom in on this one um, and you look between the two Tom Toms, this is a cool photo from the side of the kit. You can see that uh, 4936 double Tom mount you can see the same sort of, you know, two double clips. I think this is the same kit um, as the one in the uh, Keystone Corner photo. Um, 
Now, some other interesting tidbits, um, these symbol stands, at least the one uh, the, for the 18, the symbol closest uh, on his left, the symbol closest to us in the photo, um, is, a, is actually a, a, an old pearl symbol stand. Um, the same type of uh, pearl symbol stand that uh, Neil Peart used in the, in the 70s with Chromie, it's the same symbol stands that Elvin Jones used. Um, it's it's it seemed to be a popular symbol stand. Now the one that what's holding the sixteen is a weird stand. It looks like the base of a uh, Roger Swivmatic symbol holder, and this is mounted in the bass drum, like in the shell. But the top part is an old Gretsch, basically the 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 um, top of a symbol stand that would have been like a bass drum mounted symbol stand. Um, I don't know the model number offhand. Now, yeah, unfortunately, it's an odd hodgepodge of like yeah, stands exactly. where it's almost inverted, where the the be- the beefier part is sliding into the thinner part yes, on the bottom. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think he just had some random parts laying around and just kind of pieced together. Like, I want this this symbol holder in this position, you know, and let me figure out how to make it happen. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, there's all this cool smoke which is very cool, but it's obscuring the snare drum and the hi hats and a lot of other details that we'd like to see. But this is these are the only two photographs I found of this, you know, sort of in between kit that has that double tom mount. Um, And, you know, so it's sort of a, you know, before he really solidified what the what the big kit was going to be. So what that is, when we move into 76, I refer to this as the yellow monster kit because um, this is the kit that like really solidifies. This is Tony set up from now on. It's it's yellow. Let's make no. I mean, this is this is yellow. This so he's had yellow kits before. His kit in 1970, um, around the time that the band uh, that Lifetime did turn it over. Um, the gigs, you know, we looked at those in the last episode. Yep. The, the four cool piece four kit. piece bop kit. Yep in yellow. Um, it's awesome. Um, Elvin Jones had a yellow kit around the same time. Um, one of his kits from like 71, 72, we discussed may have been yellow. It's a little hard to tell from the photos. There is no doubt that this kit is yellow. So let's look at, um, one of the photos, uh, 1976 Live 3. Th- this is a series of photos that was taken by somebody. I don't know who took these, but they're amazing photos. And I thank you, whoever you are, for taking these because it's a just a, a great document of this band. And this is a gig. I don't know where it is. It's a gig um, of the Believe It era band, Alan Holdsworth, Tony Newton, Alan Pasqua, and Tony. And this is the kit sort of in its in its mature form so this is a square a, a stop sign era badge um gretch kit you know typical mid-70s gretch gretch famously designed around this time period they designed a new tom mount that they called the monster tom holder and it's pretty much universally regarded as one of the worst tom holders ever invented by any drum company um <laughs> i know some other like a lot of people really hate um the company Heyman. the british company yep. had a a very terrible tom holder uh tom mount as well but um i think this takes the cake because it um it involves this like intricate sort of ball and socket um, system and one of the worst things about it is that to mount those big ball and so- basically the ball that fits into the socket that the you know that the tom mount it mounts a tom on um, in order to put that on a tom tom you have to cut an enormous hole in the side of the drum it's like mm. a like a i don't know a two or three inch hole that has to go in the drum to fit this ball that the sort of the tom will swivel around on. wow um, and it, it's kind of hopeless because if you get these drums and you, you can't do anything to sort of retrofit them to put a better Tom holder in them because they've got this giant gaping hole in them. You have no <laughs> choice but to either put a Tom on a snare stand or to try to use the monster. Yeah. Mount. Anyway, I mean, it's a lot what, of metal when you look at it from yeah. the outside. It's, it's just too much. It's very tubular and too much yeah. metal. And but yes, that's yes. The evolution and, and there's of, a, uh, yeah there's a lot of metal on the on the tom itself too so it's sure it's not a great design um the floor toms though still have the same diamond brackets that they used in the you know starting around 58 59 
Um, also, the spurs are the same very small disappearing spurs that, you know, they use since at least, I think, the 50, the early 50s. You can see he's got on the front bass drum head, he's got a piece of tape right under the Remo logo. But then on the batter head, he's actually got uh, the, the Pratt muffler, the built-in sort of felt muffler that was adjustable that Gretsch had. So just to run down these sizes, um, yeah. because this is important, this is where, you know, again, this is, these are more or less the sizes that he stuck with for his entire rest of his career. They changed slightly when he switched to DW, but um, you will cover that in another episode. Um, the toms are two rack toms, nine by 13 and 10 by 14, and then three floor toms, three, 14 by 14, 16 by 16, and 16 by 18. And yes, he has a, the second rack tom is a 14, and the first floor tom is also a 14, which is really interesting that he's using four, actually, sorry, he's using three 14-inch drums. The snare drum is a 14, oh, yeah. second rack yeah. tom. So he was having to buy a lot of 14-inch drum heads. Yeah, exactly. Um, the bass drum is a, a 14 by 24. And, you know, it, he didn't go to, it's interesting. He didn't go to a 22. He didn't go to a 26. 24 was what he settled on. That that's, that's what I want to use. I'm going to use a 24 for the rest of my life. This week's episode is brought to you by Masters of Maple. Masters of Maple is excited to announce the 323 snare drum. An homage to downtown Los Angeles. This drum is gritty, soulful, and tough. It features a 1.2 millimeter pure copper shell. And it's outfitted with the brand new Masters of Maple Stump Badge. The 323 snare is going to be available as a 6.5x14 or as an 8x14 snare drum. And they're only making 12 of each model by hand. You can pre order the 323 snare now, or they'll be available on December 8th, 2023, only at mdrums.com. That's mdrums.com. A huge thank you to Masters of Maple for sponsoring this episode. Remind me what he was using before. Was it a 20 so, on more of his jazz sizes? Or I So we, we talked about this. Um, the kit from 7172, which has two 12-inch toms, a 14-inch floor. Yeah. I think that was an 18. It's possible it was a 20. There's some photos where it looks like a 20, but there are also photos where it looks like an 18. Um, there is also the kit um, previously in the uh, Tony Williams in Africa Um photos that looks like it could be i can't quite tell it could be a 22 it's, it's bigger, definitely not yeah. a 20 it's bigger yeah. I, it's possible it's a 24 i'm not sure but he talked about um in interviews he he talked about this a bit and and he talked about going from an 18 to a 24 and he didn't talk about any sizes in between he didn't now he may have forgotten but um there is a Modern Drummer interview where he talks specifically about, you know, when I went from an 18 to a 24. Mm -hmm. So it may have just been that. I don't, there may not have been an, a, any sort of in-between period where he's using a 20 or 22. Um, gotcha. And if he, if he was, it was not really a significant period because the music and the drumming and drum sound that made the most impact for Tony was – the period where he used an 18 and the period where he used a 24. And if there's sure. a brief period where he might have had a 20 at one point, it's not it's not as important to the story as the 18 and the 24. That's really the Tony Williams bass drum story. Gotcha. Um, also visible in this photo from 76 is the uh, the first time you see him starting to use a six and a half by 14 snare drum. There's a six and a half by 14 wood Gretsch snare drum with double lugs. It's an extremely cool looking drum. Um, I'll show you a photo later um, when we get into the 80s uh, that's basically like the first photo that I ever saw of Tony Williams that just made me think like, I've got to check this guy out. <laughs> I'll show you that in a second though. Yeah. Um, so this particular kit that I've been talking about with the monster Tom mount, um, you see this same kit in, in a number of photos. It does seem like he used this kit for a good three or four years because there are photos from um, 76, 77, 78, and 79 where he seems to have the exact same kit. Now, if we look at um, seven, 1977 VSOP1, um, this is a photo of him on stage with um, the VSOP band, which was basically Miles's 1960s 
uh, quintet, a reunion of that band, but with Freddie Hubbard playing trumpet instead of Miles, because Miles didn't want to do it. He retired uh, for an, uh, about four or five years at that point and didn't want to come back and, and do any playing. So this black and white photo of Tony, now this is, you know, the previous photo is him on stage with the Believe It band, which is a fusion, almost like a rock band. Now this is him back to playing acoustic jazz, but he's still using the same kit, same sizes, same setup. And the reason I can tell this is probably the same kit is that you can see the same strip of tape um, on the uh, on the front bass drum head. Now it's possible this was a different kit, and he just liked to do that. You know, he just taped every every bass drum up the same way in the late seventies. Or but same head, me, same head, yeah. Or kit. same head. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, yeah. but I'm guessing that this was his kit. And in these days, people more commonly flew with their own drum sets. And I think it's possible that he was flying around the world. You could still do that in those days. You could check you know, five bags and, you know, or you could yeah. actually, to be honest, what I've understood um, a lot of drummers used to do is that you would show up at an airport like JFK in New York. And, you know, in those days um, you could check in and have all your baggage taken literally at the curbside. You pull yeah, up yeah. and, and uh, I think they called a sky cap, the <laughs> yeah. person who worked for the airline that would collect yes. your bags and process everything. Apparently, in those days, you could give a sky tap, a sky cap, a a significant tip, a cash tip, maybe you know, I don't know, fifty bucks. It was a lot of money then, maybe a hundred yeah. bucks. I don't know, but you could give a sky cap a tip, and they would basically take all of your bags. Like if if you were a touring band, they take all of your stuff and just get it on the plane for you without charging you the airline's wow. excess baggage fee. And that nice. was kind of like this running sort of quasi scam that a lot of bands apparently took advantage of. Um, <laughs> apparently there were a lot of like bands, you know, not obviously not famous bands, like not big, you know, like, you know, like um, the Grateful Dead probably weren't doing this, but some of the lesser known fusion bands, jazz bands definitely were doing this. And apparently like, the ability to do this would sometimes make a tour profitable. The fact that they could get all of their stuff on the flight to Europe or wherever for basically, you know, a $50 cash wow. tip meant yeah. that they could actually make money on the tour because if they actually had to check everything and do it all sort of legitimately, Man, I'm not but saying Tony did this. I, I don't know, but, but you do see Tony with his own drums um, you know, I have other photos here of him in Japan playing what I think is the same kit and in Europe playing what I think is the same kit. And, you know, maybe he did that. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. You, you wonder about the the nowadays I would think about the like weight of the plane and having an entire <laughs> band's gear. And, you know, yeah. how they kind of like, oh, like yeah, shift yeah, yeah. around and things I, for safety. Very, but, I know that very well. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a cool photo from uh, 1978 Europe. This is, um, oh, this might not be Europe. It says festival behind him. I actually don't know where this is, but this mm. looks like the same kit, same piece of tape. All the hardware is the same. Um, you know, uh, there's a great photo from behind. This is from a live VSOP record. Um, this is this is him in, in um, Japan with the VSOP band playing for what looks like to be an enormous crowd yeah. of um, Japanese jazz fans. His seat is so high. That it's very high and it looks unbelievably uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, it's literally just like a piece of like wood with some blue... Probably uncomfortable, <laughs> scratchy fabric. I think it's a Gretsch um, throne, and it just, it really looks like an incredibly uncomfortable throne. Um, I think it's yeah. like an old style, like it's a 60s era throne. It's probably not even the best one that Gretsch made in the 70s, but I guess he liked it. Um, you know, he was still relatively young. I think as we get older, we need to really pay more attention to the comfort of our thrones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, another yeah. thing that we can see here and also in that last photo, the black and white photo, um, is the Gretsch. Now, I don't have a model number for this, but there is a Gretsch, a very um, distinctive Gretsch hi-hat stand um, that we can see, uh, that we see Tony using here. It's just a specific hi-hat stand with this very strange sort of shaped legs that kind of come out like this and oh, then I see. do this weird it, – It's it, it almost looks like a uh, – I don't know, almost looks like one of those um, hats that you see like 
the pilgrims wearing in, you know, like <laughs> early days of like, you know, um, uh, yeah. people coming over to America, like that kind yes. of shape. It's, it's a, it's a, but it, that, I think that was a popular hi-hat stand for Gretsch artists to use. Elvin used one in around that same time period. I can't really see it, but I suspect he's likely using a floating, a floating action pedal, the Gretsch floating action. Um, there's there's a video of him um, at PASIC, or no, it's a Zildjian Day in 1985, and you can see some footage. There, there's some shots of the of his feet. You can see that he's playing a floating action. I think that was the pedal that he used basically until he switched to DW. Um, mm. You know, very 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 popular pedal um, in in well, those days. Um, and speaking and, of the pedal, it, it looks like it's, which is inter interesting. Uh, if I look at one of these pictures, Europe one, and then I go to VSOP behind one, it looks like there is what looks like a Sennheiser 421, perhaps microphone on the batter side. On the batter side. Yeah. Which I guess you would do that, but there's not on the, on their previous pic picture, there's not a microphone on the front. So it's like they're getting their main signal from the batter side, which yeah, you could yeah. do, it would be Cl I, clickier I, you know i've yeah i mean i've heard people talk about that i've heard people talk about that with 18 inch bass drums too the idea of miking it from behind um it could be just to get a little bit more isolation or it could be um yeah i mean the front head you know for an 18 or any sort of like non-ported bass drum is going to yeah, have yeah. a lot of resonance even if it's sure. muffled with some tape or whatever it's it's going to be pretty potentially boomy so it might be an effort to get a little bit more definition from it or possibly yeah. to isolate it from the other stuff on stage i'm not really sure but you know it seems yeah, to, yeah clearly that's something he was experimenting with in and in, in these photos yeah, and before we move on real quick, I got to ask. Mm -hmm. So so first thing, a comment, I say completely with respect. His outfit is just kind of funny. It has like a yellow Power Ranger kind of look uh, with, he, <laughs> with the, he's yes, going full he yellow. Got, yeah, around, around this time period, around the time he started playing with VSOP until the point where he formed his own band around 85, um, he got deep into this jumpsuit look. Um, he It seems that he just went full on for for this like he just was like yes this is going to be my look i'm going <laughs> to rock for this for a good five six years and he had multiple jumpsuits they seem to all possibly be leather um not a good idea for outdoors in japan <laughs> i would think um but if they're vinyl or plastic or something also not a great idea but hey you know he went he for it man it. i yeah, think that's it looks, great he it looks had good a, he had a yellow one, as you see in this photo, which matches the kit, which is really pretty spectacular. It is cool. Um, he also had a red one. He had a green one um, that you see. There, there are a lot of videos of him. Um, luckily, the VSOP band, as as poorly um, documented as, as Miles' quintet in the 60s was, um, there's only three known, well, four if you count the Steve Allen show in September of 64. There's very little video footage of that band for as important and influential as they were and as popular as Miles was at the time. Yeah. Um, but the VSOP band um, is very well documented. There's a lot of great, besides records, um, there's a lot of really great video footage of, of them, particularly in the early 80s. Um, mm. So you can see a lot of footage of that band, and it's all great. And Tony is wearing spectacular uh, jumpsuits <laughs> in pretty much yeah. all of them. You know, it's hard to find good stage wear. I mean, I struggle with that too. And if you find something that works, you just kind of I, – I, I know I do that. I found something that yes. works with Curtis Steigers. I just wear it every – you know, like I mean I have – you know, I have a bunch of them, but I wear pretty much the same thing. Yellow you know, jumpsuit. If he's, if you see <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah if you see me with curtis i'm usually wearing a black t-shirt with a black vest on top and black jeans i do own many 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 black t-shirts and i own multiple yes. black vests it's not the same don't think that it's no, no, no. same thing with tony he probably had a cold closet full of these um jumpsuits and and there's like hey, it's like know? the homer simpson closet thing where you open it and it's just all of the same outfit <laughs> same kind of yeah. deal you um, know i mean steve yeah. jobs was like that i mean that's that's definitely a thing man i mean some yeah. very productive and talented and important people just picked something that they were going to wear and and it worked and they just they just yeah. rocked it 
So last question before we move on, and I think this yeah. is applicable to mu- much of our conversation here. So mm-hmm. three floor toms. Holy yeah. cow. That's a lot. Yeah. I'm looking at one picture here, here though. Japan won. Yeah, and they, the, the, the big 18 inch third floor Tom, even the second floor Tom is is frequently frequently referred to as the coffee table for a lot of people. That's I'm, that I'm is, seeing a cup yeah. on that thing. That's yes, looking like it, a coffee it's, table. It's a, a Coca Cola <laughs> cup. Um, yes. And I'm surprised that it's there, honestly, because in Tony's case, this is unusual to see this because he really used all three of those floor Toms. He, okay. he used that 18 a ton. There, I mean, it's not hard to find recordings of him. Any solo, he's going to be using that eighteen, and and yeah. So that that is, gotcha. I'm actually surprised to see that. That that's kind of a fluke. That may have been just a one time. Uh, he got a little lazy one day, um, but actually, that leads me to an interesting um, an interesting discovery or a, a, a hypothesis. Um, at the top of this folder um, of photos, you'll see um, 1976 great jazz trio Vanguard. Mm-hmm. So there was a group, another all-star group like VSOP called the Great Jazz Trio, which was, um, you know, it was not only led by Tony, but not really. Tony did the stage announcements for them when they played live, but it's kind of a collaborative trio. Hank Jones on piano. Um, who's a legendary pianist and also Elvin Jones' brother, uh, Ron Carter on bass and Tony on drums. And it was this all-star trio that um, I really, really love. And there is a series of three records they did live at the Village Vanguard that I really, really love. Um, And it's Tony just playing perfect, like 70s jazz trio drumming. I really love the way he plays. And... I found a photograph of them um, that was from Swing Journal magazine, which was a uh, a Japanese jazz magazine um, that I think lasted a in, it kind of into the aughts. Um, and I don't know when it started, but um, there are, it's often a lot of great photography in Swing Journal that you won't see anywhere else. And yeah. um, I tried tracking down some old. Uh, issues of it um, when I went to the Rutgers Jazz Library um, in New Jersey to do research for this podcast. But um, unfortunately, they, they were so delicate, they had taken them to a secure site. They actually didn't have them available for, for research hmm. purposes anymore. But this photo I found online, and it's a photo of, of the Great Jazz Trio at the Vanguard. Now, it doesn't appear to be that one of the nights they were recording because you don't see any microphones, but that is definitely the Vanguard. And an interesting thing about those recordings is that if you listen very closely to what Tony plays during his solos and you kind of figure out what he's doing, you actually realize he does not have his standard three floor tom setup of the time. He mm. only has one floor tom on these live at the Vanguard ja- Great Jazz Trio records. And this photo, you can kind of see he's got his normal... Um, you can see the monster Tom mounts. He's got at least the ride crash uh, and little crash, if not the far right crash that he would normally use. Again, I'll talk about that setup when we do the symbol episode. But you can kind of see, you see Tony standing behind his kit, and I only see one floor Tom. I don't see any other floor Toms. Usually they're kind of staggered further out going towards the, the, the his right, you know, yeah. our left. And I only see the one. And definitely on those recordings, you do not hear anything more than three toms. Is it a logistics smaller room? It is a very fit? small room. And and I know that setup there very well. I, I've played with the big band at the Vanguard a lot. I've never played a small group where the drums are set up on, on stage left there. But I've been, you know, a hundred times to see different drummers. And it is a pretty tight space. But Tony did play there in a lot in the 80s with his own band. And as far as I know, he would always bring his full setup then. But for whatever reason, when he did these recordings, he did this run in 76, um, he d- apparently did not use the 16 and 18 floor toms. You only hear the 13, 14, 14. Um, and I can tell it's the 14 because of the pitch. It's a very, very close in pitch. This is an interesting sure. thing, too, about these sizes. They're, they're 13, 14, and 14, you know, 
It's two of the same size and one that's just an inch smaller. And he generally tuned them very, very close in pitch to one another, where there were almost maybe just a half step between those three toms. And I actually love that in Tony's fills and especially in his solos that he had these really close intervals between those first three toms and he gets into some really interesting melodic ideas. The fact that he doesn't have this huge range between those. Now the, the bigger floor toms, he did tune bigger, you know, greater angles or greater intervals between them. But those first three were tuned quite similar in pitch hmm. and i think it it just sounds very interesting and you hear that all over this record so anyway that's a that's a bit of an outlier in this era of him using a slightly different setup and then what we move on to again as i said he seemed to use this kit until around 79 he then got a kit in 70 you start to see photos of him in the late very late 70s into the early 80s where he seems to have um a kit. Well, basically, what you see that changes is um, what Gretsch called their Techware series of hardware. So the sizes are all the same, same as I listed before. Um, the color is still yellow. You know, heads and everything are the same. Um, he gets into some different symbols. I'll do that in the other episode. But we see Techware hardware. He gets rid of. Finally, we don't see the monster Tom mount anymore. Gretsch, I think realized that they designed a pretty um not a great tom mount in that era and they they changed to um i think it was a company they they refer to it as cr research i think you see that mentioned with techware hardware mm. and i don't know if that was like a company that designed it for them or or what that means but um uh it, it's actually really good hardware i actually really like the techware era of gretch um, that's also for me sentimental because that's when I became aware of Gretsch as a company. It was sort of in the mid eighties that I started seeing these cool Gretsch ads and like the back of modern drummer magazine. And, um, yeah. I just think that hardware looks good. And I've had a couple of Gretsch kits that I've owned that have had that hardware on it. And it's actually still to this day, very functional. It's, yeah. it's well-designed hardware and still works quite well. Um, well, the eighties things changed because I mean, before that it was like, there was the Swivomatic, which, um, it was its own whole thing that changed things. And the rest yeah. of it was just kind of terrible. But then the Japanese brands made things better. Right. And then the American brands could copy it a little bit. And so this it just the, got better. The, the Gretsch Techware Tom mounts and floor Tom mounts and things, and, and the Spurs actually, for that matter, too, are actually not that dissimilar from Tama's uh, hardware at the time. Mm. If you look at like kind of late 70s uh, Tama, like kind of in that Billy Cobham era, 77, 78, Billy Cobham, Lenny White, um, eventually Neil Peart. Um, it's it's somewhat similar. It's it's you know kind of a blocky tom bracket, um, a, 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 a a tom mounting system. The actual holder is is actually very similar to Ludwig's that they designed in the sixties, um, mm -hmm. and then disappearing spurs, but very chunky disappearing spurs. Um, but I I like this era for Gretsch, and I like this hardware quite a bit. Now, if we look at this Gretsch ad um, that. It starts to show up in Modern Drum around 81, 82. That photo may be from a little earlier. Um, I actually don't see any badges on this kit, so I don't actually know if this is a square badge or if this is a drop G badge or what. But we can see that he's still using his 70s era snare drum. Um, you actually see the snare has a, a 70s era um, stop sign badge. It's not a yeah. drop G badge. Um, it's six it's, and a half a by preview. 14. Yeah. Same six and a half by 14. It's, it's uh, eight, you know, well, 16 lugs, eight double lugs. We get a little later into the eighties. He starts using a uh, 10 lug per head. So a 20 lug um, six and a half. But at this point he's still using the, um, the, the, the seventies version, which is um, for him was the, the uh, 16 lug. Now, an interesting thing that he does, and you see this throughout the 80s, is he actually mounts his toms technically upside down. Um, you'll see the tom brackets are at the bottom of the drum on the two rack toms. Gretsch designed their toms so that the muffler knobs faced the drummer, so that the drummer could adjust them 
on the gig, presumably even while playing with one hand. But Tony maybe just liked the way they looked, and they do look cool. I love the way those, that those yeah. mufflers look. Those two knobs on the front of the toms I think looks really cool. And maybe Tony wanted that to face forward and maybe didn't want the badge to face forward. I don't know. But effectively, because there were only, you know, these the, the only way to mount the drum – so that the mufflers faced out, I think would have been to mount the drum basically upside down like this. Um, but it also, the drums didn't have, you know, you can you can sort of make it out if you really zoom in on that 82 Gretsch ad. The, the Techware tom brackets on the mounted on the toms actually said Gretsch on them. They were They were sort of engraved with the, not engraved, but embossed, is that the word? With the Gretsch logo. Something, yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter, like it could be right side up. It, there's no specific, there's nothing that says that the drum, and, and actually, this actually makes me think that this could be a square badge kit because the square badge, the badge is actually looks the same upside down or right side up. It yep. says Gretsch top and bottom. and Going both ways. Yeah, going both ways. So um, it didn't really matter if it was upside down or w- there wasn't really a right way. Now, if you look at the Gretsch catalog, there was a, a Gretsch catalog in 84 that came out that's called the poster catalog because it's it's basically a big poster that folds out that's got a big giant kit on one side and the other side is a bunch of kits that you could buy and all the different sizes and stuff. It's a very cool poster. Um, you can see it on, uh, there's a website, um, I've probably referenced it before, uh, drumarchive.com. Oh, man. There's an episode with Andy Yule who started Drum Ah, Archive, which Andy's awesome and does it as a passion project. And yeah, I feel like maybe we talked about this in the last episode. I apologize if we it was so long ago that we filmed it. I don't remember. But but um, a lot of these old Gretsch catalogs, as well as, you know, Tama and Sonar and all these great uh, like old premiere catalogs is a super cool website. Um, But you can see the Gretsch poster website. My point in bringing that up is that. Gretsch's own philosophy of how to mount their toms, the way that all of their kits are photographed in this era, was for that tom bracket to be at the top of the tom, um, not the bottom. So according to Gretsch, Tony is mounting them upside down, but, you know, Tony can do whatever he wants, Yeah, obviously. (laughs) So, all right, we're talking hardware on the kit here. Like, looking at the 1982 Gretsch ad that I love the tagline being, someday you'll own a Gretsch. Like, that's just interesting. That's so good. That's, you know, I mean, we could say that Gretsch made, you know, they had some missteps here and there in their history. Every company does. But, man, they had some great, I mean, just the idea of, like, the great Gretsch sound as a a tagline. It's it's very iconic. It's brilliant. And I love that. Someday you'll own Gretsch. It's, it's, It's really great. And that, too, references the fact that at this point, there were a lot of drummers that owned or endorsed other kits but actually did own a Gretsch kit at home or had a Gretsch kit that they recorded with. Um, like Neil. Like Neil. Neil had a Gretsch kit at home. Uh, Jeff Percaro was famous for using a Gretsch kit in the studio. Uh, Vinny yeah. Kaliuta used a Gretsch kit in the studio before he was a Gretsch endorser. And I think that that tagline kind of references that, which is yeah. kind of slightly snarky, but but really quite cool. Inspirational, um, too. But the, yeah, the question yeah, is, or is... aspirational. The- aspirational yeah. yeah all the uh spirationals it's so looking at the bass drum there's like the mega giant kind of hardware on the inside yeah are those the spurs those are the sticking? spurs yeah what? that was a gretch why thing. that was so part long? of the tech wear well i'll tell you why because a lot of um a lot of drummers were using single-headed drums um, especially the bass drum, even if they use double headed toms, a lot of drummers you'd see with no front head on the bass drum. And, um, if you have big, heavy toms on top of a kit that doesn't have, so I, I the, the head uh, and the hoop kind of help add structure to the bass drum shell. Sure, it kind of yes. adds. So the idea behind those spurs, so those spurs go through, they're disappearing spurs that go through, they function as spurs, but they reach all the way up to the top of the shell and they actually kind of lock in to this sort of plate that's at the top of the shell and they actually help support the shell and keep it round even if you had the front head off or even if you had the front head on but you had you know you could the the um 
the, the, these Tom systems were sort of modular. Um, that's a term I shouldn't use because Ludwig had at the same time modular period, had Tom yeah, yeah. modular modular hardware. With, yep. with the idea being that you you know people were getting into mounting three toms on a bracket and maybe two symbols off of it too. You know yep. that kind of thing that was becoming popular. So you needed um, a bass drum that could support all of that weight. So that was you know kind of the idea. I, I think I know Yamaha made something too that you see in. Yamaha catalogs in the 80s, they made basically a pipe that kind of could expand. They would so go from Tama, top to bottom. Yeah, to, right. I, that's right. I learned that in the Lars episode with Chris Ruscio, where where he said, uh, hey, I found this piece of gear, and it was a tiny little kind of footnote in a catalog. And it we, we joked that it looked like kind of like a, you know, a club or whatever for your car, where you just stick it in the bass drum and extend right, it. Right, right, right. It, it makes sense. It's the same And Lars era. used that? Yes. For, for Interesting. A, period there that i think it was mid 80s yeah 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 you can also see it's mostly hidden but on tony's left our right you can see um he's using by this point techware uh simple stands which um are kind of famous they they had um they had a distinctive look and to me the most distinctive thing about them was that they uh they had um the felts at the top were basically like either white or like a very, very, very light gray. Hmm. And um, Charlie Watts was also a fan of those. He used those, I think, basically, you know, until he passed. I think his symbol stands always had those. Now, um, somebody, again, could could uh, clarify that for me. But sure. you see a lot of photos. Not every – I'm looking at some 80s photos. Not every photo of Tony, but there are definitely photos where he's got um, these techware stands with the lighter – colored felts actually if you go to the next folder we get into the 80s and we get to the square badge kits um there's a there's a, a photo i labeled called gretch poster which is a another gretch ad that was that ran in modern drummer and it's a great photo of tony standing in front of his kit and this is actually interesting because this is a kit where he has the toms mounted the uh, the official Gretsch way. You can see he has them mounted on. Is there, it, this is, the, I don't know if the, this is probably not the same kit. It's probably another identical um, yellow Gretsch 80s kit square badge. Um, but he's got the toms mounted with the, the brackets are at the top and the badges are facing front instead of the, uh, instead of the, uh, the, the muffler um, knobs. You can see though on the ride symbol, he's got a, a Gretsch Techware stand here and he's got the, uh, the light colored um, uh, felts at the top, um, which is that sort of distinctive look. Um, now also in this photo, this is, this is a unique kit because he's got a white coated Gretsch logo head, which I don't think I'd ever seen him with a white coated he always had a, a a clear head on front, um, so that's kind of unusual. Um, so this would be like, hey, we have a set set up. Come to this photo studio, stand there, kind of doing I, this position, and then. Well, I imagine this was his kit, but oh, okay, you know, okay, I think okay. maybe they maybe they made that kit, and you know, he went to the factory to do the photo. Got I'm it. not I'm not actually sure. I mean, this could have been taken anywhere, but you know, it's it's an it's it's a front head that he would not normally use, and it's a Tom configuration. The bracket being in the right place is something in the '80s, at least, that you don't really see. I I, I can you know, if we look at these various photos, like um, at the top here, 19, you can see um, Tony with the uh, you know techware hardware mufflers facing front, Tom brackets on the bottom, um. Yeah. You know, that's something you consistently see. There's another one, 1982 Live, a good photo of him. Um, now, this is interesting. Oh, yeah. I just noticed he's still got in this photo. Um, now, this was dated. I found this on, uh, I found this somewhere, Stu is, uh, credited to Stuart Nicholson. This did have a date on it of 1982, and he still has that um, stop sign era badge snare drum um, that he's using with his 80s era kit. Um, you can see he's wearing the green jumpsuit, of course, in this photo, too. He does have every color, really. I mean, I've yeah. seen red. I see it's purple. Great. I see all the colors, yeah, which is very cool. And just to kind of, like, put it into perspective here a little bit, I believe now that we're at 1980, born yeah. in 45, he would be 35 years old at this yeah. point yeah. in 1980. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That That's that, – I mean, he's still – still a young guy you know yeah um yeah he's not even 40 yet um 
let's see what photos I want to look at. Um, just as a personal photo or a p- personal thing to point out, if we look at um, 1984 modern uh, MD side, this was a, a um, he was on the cover of Modern Drummer in um, it's either June or July of 1984, and um, this was a I, I remember getting this issue. Um, having this when it was when it was basically new when I was a kid and cool. um, this photo of him from the side with that Gretsch snare drum with the with the double lugs this photo I didn't know who Tony Williams was I didn't know any I'd never heard him but I saw this photo and I remember like this photo was like okay I have to find out who this guy is this guy <laughs> this it's guy cool. is clearly the guy there is th- this th- it was just he's so cool he's yeah. just so cool intense. In this photo he's he's Super, intense but he's relaxed but he, it's like confidence it's yeah, yeah. It, it's just it's like you just know that this guy that, like this is the guy i need to start checking out i just knew yeah. this was like a a, a a call you know to yeah. me that like all right i need to i need to investigate this, this i will be on a drummer. podcast someday i need to <laughs> investigate this guy <laughs> someday there will be things called podcasts and uh, yeah uh and oh, so yeah. so that was yeah and and we see that snare drum uh, a funny thing to mention i'm going to talk about sticks in the later episode but um he actually started doing this in the mid 70s but you can actually see he's got a stick bag a leather stick bag mounted on the snare drum that was a thing that he did. Now I, I I know other drummers that have that have um that do this and and had done this, but um this was a, a somewhat uniquely Tony thing. He may have been the first to do this, um, mounting the stick bag on the snare. Most people now actually there was a there is a photo um the one we looked at before of in Japan um from behind where we were talking about the throne and the coke cup. He actually in that in this photo he has his uh uh stick bag mounted on the first floor tom which is kind of the standard way that we mount our stick bags right on the floor tom but um but you know there are other photos um where he's got it mounted off the snare so that was it that makes was a thing. sense well it's, it's not- actually closer to what you're yeah. you know and you can reach sticks with both hands which you can't really do quite as comfortably with the stick bag on the floor tom i guess um, your legs might get a little in the way but anyway it makes sense and and he's got some yeah. super wide uh super wide snare strainer many uh oh many many snares on there the wires yeah that's yeah, true actually yeah that's the gretch um i guess that would be the 42 strand Gretsch snare uh, Gretsch snare wires that is a good point he didn't always use those I, I've seen other photos maybe not from this era maybe by this era when he's using the six and a half he's always using the super wide snares um, I've tried those personally I can't get anything happening with those snares I they just sort of buzz like crazy for me huh. but um, I have tried those but yeah Tony was apparently a fan of them um, interesting which is pretty cool yeah and yeah yeah, yeah. that that's it, it's their their photos i mean i'd have to go back to the stuff we already talked about the uh the 60s stuff but now i kind of want to go because i know there's one or two photos where you can kind of see under the snare and i now i kind of want to see if he's got yeah wow okay i i don't think we talked about this when we did the 60s but there's a photo, a couple photos here of him playing his um, 60, the, the black kid in 1964. There's there's one from Paris, October 1964. And you can see under the snare, he's got his 4160 snare. And it looks pretty obvious that he's got the super wide 42 strand snares on that too, the wires. So I guess he had been using them as far back as then. So sorry, I missed that. Hey. Um, but that's a great catch. I'm glad that you you noticed that. Very um, cool. Yeah. If we go back to the 80s um, folder here and we look at this photo, um, that's actually a... Uh, this is from something I found on Drum Archive, the uh, the Gretsch price list. Um, besides catalogs, they have um, a lot of the manufacturers would would um, publish a price list that just had all the model numbers and had the uh, you know the the retail prices, and these were made just for um, retailers. And in this was a 1987 Gretsch price list, and they actually had a Tony Williams official Tony Williams setup available. Um, that you can see in this photo and it lists these sizes basically just as I listed them 14 by 24 bass drum a 9 by 13 
and 10 by 14 toms, rack toms, 14 by 14, 16 by 16, 16 by 18 floor toms, and the six and a half by 14 snare. They even list the, um, you know, t uh, three cymbal stands, um, hmm. hi-hat stand, tom holder, or snare stand. And yeah, they show the configuration. They've got that picture of Tony and the prices, the list prices at that time, $4,080. Now I'm, I'm not actually sure. I assume so there's three different prices here, G, L, and X. I don't know if that meant like lacquer finishes were more than covered finishes. Maybe wraps huh. cost less, or maybe that was giving suggested retail prices. There was a list price and then a suggested discount. I'm not, I'm not sure yeah. what those prices refer to. It's a substantial um, jump from the X. And just again, people to explain people who are like not watching this video and who are, mm. you know, just walking the dog or whatever listening. Yeah, sorry about that. It says that. price G 4080 price and then in quotes L 3335 X 2880. So there is a substantial yeah. jump uh in price there and just because it's always fun to do the whatever inflation calculator yeah. in 1987 $4080 it says on this website uh that's eleven thousand dollars today in spending pa purchasing power so now man, that's we are talking about set. a lot of drums it's you know yeah. a big bass drum two rack toms three floors and a snare cymbal but that stands does still, and cymbal stands that does seem like a lot of money um you know that's like when i think of eleven thousand dollars for a kid i'm thinking like you know yamaha phoenix or craviato yeah. or something super super high end and exclusive like that but you know, those kind of prices weren't necessarily something, you know, recent. And and I see actually, this is maybe too much of a tangent, but, you know, I see people um, often on drum forums complaining about the prices of drums and cymbals these days. And, oh, I can't believe that so-and-so is making a such and such that costs this much. And But if you do look at inflation calculators, stuff has always been expensive. It's, it's, yeah. it's costly to manufacture these things. These are not... You know, these are these are not just you know run of the mill. Uh, you know, it's not like a a a a a Ford pickup truck or something. Not that there's anything you know wrong with a Ford pickup truck, but but you know these are things that are made in extremely high numbers, extremely yeah. high volumes on a production line. And a Gretsch kit in the '80s was basically a custom made kit, just as a Craviato kit is now, or a Yamaha phoenix kit you know they're made to order and they're there's just a handful of people that make these things and they are really made by hand and and they're special instruments and they're not production line kind of things you know and and they're not like it's still even in the the biggest drum and cymbal companies it's still kind of just a handful of really skilled workers that make these things so it i think it's i mean it's expensive to buy this stuff but i think it's always been expensive yeah, um, exactly. You know. But I mean, eleven thousand dollars—the amount of people who would be buying that kind of a drum set at a drum shop had to be very minimal. But if you sell one, pretty good, you know, <laughs> yeah. bonus for uh, for the year of the shop. But um, definitely, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's cool to see this though—the Tony Williams setup yeah. and and with the picture and all that. Yeah. So I want to look very briefly at. Um, I'm kind of speculating, but I do think this is kind of the era where he started to have multiple kits in multiple locations. Like he'd have a kit that he stored in New York. He had a kit that he kept at home in San Francisco where he lived at this point and probably had a kit in Tokyo and maybe had a couple kits floating around Europe for when he'd have gigs there too. Um, so I don't know how many of these kits there were, but one thing I do know is that you see photos like the ones we've looked at so far where the kits have relatively normal um, chrome hardware. Um, but if we look at this next folder, um, and I could oddly only find one really proper photo of this, but he had a, at least one kit, maybe more, that had black hoops um, on all of the toms and the bass drum also had black hoops front and back. If you want to see this kit, now I've just showed you this, I, I found this one photo, um, that I think is from around 1990, but there is 
a ton, a ton of videos on YouTube of Tony. Um, this is why I think that this might have been a kit that he kept in Europe. There's video of him in Europe where he's got this kit with the black hoops. There's also some video from around 87 in Japan where he's got a kit with black hoops. And there's also a famous video, Tony Williams Live in New York, that's from around 89, I think, where he's got a kit with black hoops. Now, this might have just been one kit that he went around the world with and happened to film these videos. But for whatever reason, a lot of the video footage of him in this era, he's got that kit. So there were at least two, one with the black hoops and one without that we that we know of. Um, yeah. Makes so, sense to have kits here and there and different things. But oh, it's cool with the black, yeah. the black hardware. And I've noticed that in... Looks like 1989. I'm looking at a picture that says Chicago Jazz Showcase. Mm -hmm. It looks like his symbol hardware between, between ah, the pictures here. Well, it looks like, and, and I can't remember what we're talking about and not talking about, but I'll yeah. just say that it appears there's, we're getting into some better, his middle stand is the, no longer definitely. that wonky kind of, yeah, we're getting into yeah. a boom, boom stand. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so you can still see on um, the uh, Gretsch poster. Yes. The one that we looked at where he has the white front bass drum head, he still got yeah. at least on mounted on the bass drum is actually a Swivomatic, um, an old like Roger Swivomatic um, mount on yep. the bass drum. And I can't really tell what's at the top of that stand, but it doesn't look like a particularly modern cymbal holder. But yeah, by the time we get to 1989, Chicago uh jazz showcase he's got a pretty relatively modern um boom symbol that 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 I believe is mounted with a multi clamp onto his double tom mount but you can also see in this same photo you can see those uh Gretsch Techware symbol stands with the light colored felts um that I mentioned that there're also some kind of unique looking wing nuts at the top of tops of those stands um yeah that that gets us basically into the 90s um Oh, you know what I will cover? There's an ad. He he did a, 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 a an ad as an endorser for Shore Microphones. This is an interesting kit because, well, first of all, we've got a just a white-coated front bass drum head with no um, Gretsch logo. We don't have a Gretsch uh, Pratt muffler on the bass drum. We can actually see a bit of felt sticking out, like he actually manually added felt in the same place where the Pratt muffler would have been. What's really interesting about this kit is that for the first time, we see that Gretsch apparently made a kit where they said, okay, we want the badges facing front, but we, we, we recognize that you like to put the brackets, you like to have the brackets at the bottom. So we've got the Tom brackets on the bottom, but we've got the Gretsch badge is facing front and apparently the, the, the muffler knobs, if they're on at all, which, you know, this is kind of the point you get into the nineties and Gretsch stopped making drums standard with the, the mufflers. Certainly by this point, I actually have a, um, a 1985, uh, vintage Gretsch kit. It's the only vintage drum set that I still own. Um, actually planning on selling it soon, but, um, uh, that's another story. It, it actually is a factory kit. It's 12, 14, 20, and it doesn't have any mufflers on it, which was a bit unusual for that period. Still in 85, they, they often were, were standard putting mufflers on the, you know, the top hmm. and bottom mufflers on yeah. the toms and all of Tony's kits, um, through the eighties have them, but this kit does not, or it doesn't seem to, it doesn't have the Pratt muffler. And if it does, oh no, I'm, you know what? I'm wrong. I'm looking now. I can see on the 13. Look at that. There is a muffler on the bottom head. You can see it through the oh, yeah. CS yeah, black yeah. dot. I see. Okay. Well, I'm wrong. So it's, it's, it's oriented differently, but the badges and the brackets and the mufflers are all in different places than they had previously been. Another funny thing is that for the purposes of this photo, it appears that they may have asked Tony to please take his middle symbol off because notice it's For not some face there. action. Yeah, exactly. But if you look closely at the Tom bracket, the Tom mount, you can actually see a multi clamp, an empty multi clamp that's there. So this is when, you know, by this point, as you mentioned, he's using a boom symbol arm that's that's on a multi clamp. 
And um, at this point, you know, that's what he was using. And he took it off for this photo, but didn't take the multi-clamp off of the Tom mount. So it's still sitting there empty, but that's where the little, the smaller symbol would have been mounted. And it's clearly, as you said, so that his face is visible in the photo. One thing also to point out is that he, for whatever reason at this point, is using a pearl hi-hat stand. Um, now, sometimes guys would be on the road and their hi-hat stand might break and they've got to go to a, a music store and maybe that's the only hi-hat stand they had that he liked. Maybe yeah. they didn't have a, a Gretsch that he liked or a Gretsch hi-hat stand at all. So he just picked one up when he was on the road and he just kind of continued using it. But sure. um yeah, otherwise the symbol stands that we well the one that we see is is uh the Gretsch um techware. Yeah. Um yeah, so so that's a good addition there and that's interesting to see him advertising for other I mean that's drum related obviously. Yeah, but yeah, like, that, it's, I remember it's this run of I remember this run of ads because Peter Erskine did one as well um where he's got his really beautiful blue maple custom kit um that ran right around the same time this is maybe around 92 or 93 and um and and uh you know so Peter Peter and Tony both signed on as short microphone endorsers around that time. Okay, so uh, to explain a little bit real quick, because we're going to keep going and we're going to talk about Tony's backline kits, mm -hmm. but you may have noticed that we stopped at about 1990. Uh, yeah, roughly. That, yeah, and that is because uh, we, on the next, so I believe part three with Paul is going to be symbols, sticks, hardware, and then part four of this mega Tony Williams <laughs> deep dive is going to be with Scott Garrison, who was Tony Williams drum tech uh, from the basically the mid 90s through his, the end of his life, which was 97, yeah. which so early 90s to, you know, uh, end of his life. So he spent the last remaining days with him. So that'll be awesome to hear that. We're going to leave that chunk of time for Garrison, which Garrison is now the artist relations, marketing and manufacturing kind of guru with DW drums. And that's since Tony, that's kind of what he's been. Uh, that's how I've heard of him. So, so I'm excited yeah. to have him on here. Um, yeah, but, Garrison's a, a a legend in the industry and has worked with so many incredible drummers. Um, and you know, spent a lot of time with Tony. And and I mean, he's just he is the guy to talk about this era. Yeah. So um, yeah. we're going to hand it to him. Um, but I do want to cover um, a, a number of backline kits um, and and. Particularly in the 60s, Tony was often, not often, but sometimes seen using backline kits. And I i am i think that there are times where people confuse them with, you know, thinking that this was one of Tony's kits when in fact it was a backline kit. Um, there's a period where he used backline a lot in between 66 and 67. So let's look at that folder of photos. And there's a, there's a lot here, but um, there's some interesting... The, the, basically, the main use of backline for Tony was at the two uh, Newport jazz festivals that the Miles Davis Quintet played. They played Newport in 1966 and 1967 um, in the summer, July, I think. Um, and both times, it seems, Tony used backline gear. So the, the gentleman who founded the Newport Jazz Festival, and I believe probably also the Newport Folk Festival, um, and continued to run it until his passing very recently, um, was a gentleman named George Ween, who is a very important jazz impresario who... I, you know, dating back at least until the mid fifties, maybe earlier ran the Newport jazz festival, which is one of the, the biggest, you know, music festivals around. And, um, he also was a tour promoter. He would put on Newport became so popular that they actually would take the Newport jazz festival to Europe and to other places. So there's a lot of like, you'll see these sort of big tours that he put on, and one of them was in the fall of 67. There was a Newport Jazz Festival in Europe, and the Miles Davis Quintet was on that. So there are a lot of backline kits from that tour, too. But let's start with 1966. Um, there's a very famous photo that you see of Tony a lot, and I have it labeled here as 1966 Newport 3. And this is a photo of Tony playing kind of a, a funny hodgepodge kit 
where we have a Ludwig um, Burgundy Sparkle 8x12 rack tom and what looks like a, a 20 inch, uh, sorry, an 18 inch bass drum um, that also has a Ludwig logo on the front head. So we assume that the drum is Ludwig. Um, it's mm-hmm. got disappearing spurs that um, Ludwig 18s had during that time period. But we have a white marine pearl floor tom that looks to me, I think, like a Slingerland, right? That's Those are Slingerland um, floor tom brackets, I think. Um, and it kind of looks like a stick saver hoop. So it's kind of a hodgepodge kit. I can't really tell what the snare is, but it looks like it could be a metal snare. Um, and we see a Ludwig. It looks like a Ludwig spur lock um, uh, uh, hi-hat stand. Um, and I remember hearing somebody saying, oh, that photo is of Tony at Lincoln Center recording the foreign more concert he you know played the foreign more concert with this ludwig kit with a slingerland floor tom and i'm not sure where that person got this information from but if we look at there's a a couple photos that i have also here newport 1966 newport one now this is tony with you see the miles davis quintet well minus herbie you can't really see him and it says the newport festival right behind them Clearly not the 1964 Foreign More concert. You can see that Ludwig bass drum. He's got a little towel sort of toweled up on top of the yep. bass drum, which you Stick, see in that previous photo. Of the, yep, the yep. white marine pearl floor tom. If you look at Newport 2, the next photo, you can see, um, you can't see the whole sign, but you see the same sign that says festivals. Um, and you see the same kit. Now, what's interesting here is we can see the matching burgundy sparkle floor tom the Ludwig floor tom for this kit behind the oh, yeah. the big yeah, floor yeah, tom. Yeah. What I bet happened is that he or whoever played before him broke the head of the 14-inch floor tom that matched this kit. And they were like, well, let's find another floor tom. So somebody brought on a Slingerland floor tom from somebody else's kit. Who knows? I have to look at the... Um, I should, you can usually find these things, actually, the roster of who played Newport that year. It'd be interesting to see who played before and after Miles because it could have been somebody like Buddy Rich who played a White Marine Pearl Slingerland floor tom. Wow, that'd be cool. Mm, although in 1966, actually, I think I think Buddy was still with um, – he was still with Rogers then or possibly was with Vox – yeah, it might have been the period? Trickson. Trickson box, Trickson I Fox. think, was 67, but it was like okay. six months. Yeah. So and there was Rogers. Yeah, but it was, was, but it was yeah. before, so it would have been Rogers. So it would may not have been Buddy's kid, but a lot of people played Slingerland, White Marine, Pearl drums. It could have been yeah. Gene Krupa, you know, or any number yeah. of other drummers. So it's, it's probably cool. some, <laughs> it's definitely someone cool. I mean, they're playing Newport in 1966. Yeah. <laughs> this is actually a famous photo of Miles. If you look to the to the Tony's left, to the right of the photo, you see Miles' silhouette sort of walking away from the stage. And I've actually seen that photo and other sources sort of just crop, just Miles' um, figure yeah. there with, with Tony cropped out. But um, yeah, so this is the kit that's used on the 1966, uh, which, is, which is recorded and was released on, uh, there's a Miles Davis at Newport box set that you can get that has all of his Newport performances, including 66 and 67. Now, 1967 Newport one here is that's, that's Wayne Shorter and you can't see Tony, but there are other photos from this, from this gig. And you can see that he is playing none other than Don Lamont's Gretsch kit. Don Lamont was a great drummer who played with mm-hmm. all sorts of people, probably most famously with Woody Herman in the in the later 40s, but became a really successful studio drummer um, and a uh, really great drummer and apparently was on this bill and Tony used his kit. Now, if we look closely at this kit, we see a pretty big bass drum. Um, it's Gretsch. We see um, what looks to be white satin flame, um, a very popular uh, finish for Gretsch in the mid 60s. And we see a riveted symbol that looks like it's maybe a little smaller, like it's a 20. Um, and it's a little hard to tell from this photo whether that's an A or a K. The lathing mm-hmm. looks like it could go either way. But to me, to my pretty well trained vintage symbol eyes, that looks like an A. 
But we're going to get to that in a minute. Well, actually, yep. we're not going to get to that in a minute. We're going to get to that no. in the symbol episode. So part three. Sorry, sorry to 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 tease, but well, we also have a Hollywood Miazzi. Yeah, or whatever it's so pronounced so kit. this yeah. is where we get onto this tour. So I mentioned they did Newport in '66, and then they did it again July of '67. Now, in the fall of '67, the Miles Davis Quintet is booked to do a practically a month long European tour. Um, that um, the dates of this tour um, is basically the end of October through, you know, so, sort of like the second half of October into the beginning of, of November are the confirmed dates that we have um, this European tour. And um, it's a multi-band tour. And they actually, there was something like 10 or 12 different acts that were all traveling Europe and they would sort of double up um, and sometimes they'd all be, you know, different bands would be on the same bill together. So sometimes Miles would be booked with, um, uh, apparently they were often on a double bill with Archie Shep's uh, group, which was a very avant-garde group. Um, but they also were apparently, well, they were on the bill with all kinds of different people. And Tony, it's basically confirmed that Tony was forced to use backline drums and cymbals on this tour. He, for whatever reason, um, he was required to not bring his own stuff. Now, hmm. there's a box set that I have here in my CD collection. Um, the Miles Davis um, uh, Quintet, my, live in Europe, 1967. So a great thing about Europe is that um, a lot of jazz gigs in Europe were recorded by radio stations and broadcast. And because of that, we have a lot of tour, a lot of this music is, you know, now available to hear. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, and there was a lot of great research done for these liner notes that were written by um, Ashley Kahn, um, who is a great jazz writer. And he interviewed some people that were that are still with us who were on that tour. And I need to take a second to find the quote. Here we go. Um, Memories of the touring menagerie cover the delights and complaints of life on the road. Gary Burton, who was a great vibraphonist, um, very, very great vibraphonist. Gary Burton crossed paths with Miles' group in an airport and remembers Tony Williams saying that, quote, Due to the schedule, they were using borrowed basses and drum sets, and he wished they had their own equipment, end quote. So this is confirmation from Gary Burton, who was on that tour, that um, Tony specifically said that they were not able to use their own drum gear and their own – Ron Carter had to use rented basses. Now yeah. – an interesting thing about this tour is that Don Lamond apparently was also on this tour. And Don Lamond was part of a group called the Newport All Stars, which was kind of a trad jazz slash swing um, group. He's not actually listed for whatever reason. It, 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 he was he was part of this all star group that was this sort of you know traditional, somewhat more traditional jazz group. And for whatever reason, Don did bring his drums on this tour because there are multiple photos and video of Tony playing Don Lamont's drum set. Now, mm. I showed you the photo before from 67 from the Newport Festival in, in America where you can actually see that it says Don Lamont on the bass drum. Yeah. Now, there's another photo that I found of Sarah Vaughn's trio. Sarah Vaughn was on this tour, and I don't even know who her drummer was, but um, there's a photo of her. It's actually a screenshot from a video of them in Stockholm, and you can see that her drummer is also playing the same kit, Don Lamont's kit, with the same Don Lamont stencil on the bass drum head. Um, and you can see uh, the it's an 8x12 um, rack tom in... Um, white satin flame it looks to be a 22 inch bass drum and then a, a 16 inch floor tom it's a little hard to tell from this photo but the floor tom for whatever reason was actually white marine pearl which looks mm. close enough to white satin flame yeah. that i guess no Passes. one was really bugged but when you see it close up you realize that it's actually a different color now i bring this up because you see this drummer playing these drums in this in this photo with sarah vaughn and that same concert in Stockholm was a concert that Miles 
played. And there are a lot, there, there's, a, there's a video. This is one of the shows that was actually videotaped um, and shown on TV in Sweden, apparently. And the videotape still survived. And you can see this on YouTube. And it's been part of sort of, it's actually part of this box set back before hmm. YouTube. They actually put a DVD in here. Nice, yeah. And you can see Tony playing this exact same kit throughout this concert. Um, if we look at 1967 Stockholm 7, this is Tony. Now, there's never any shots where you can see the front bass drum head that blatantly says Don Lamont, but you can see this is clearly the same kit. Sure, sure. 8 it is, by 12, yeah. 16 by 16, 22 inch bass drum, white satin flame, bass drum and rack tom with a, with a white marine pearl uh, floor tom. Um, you can kind of see it in 67 Stockholm 6. You can kind of see the floor tom there. So there's a, there's a photo of Don Lamond in this. Um, in the in in this folder where you can see actually see Don Lamont playing his own kit for once, and it looks if you look closely <laughs> yeah. at the backdrop, it actually looks like that same Newport backdrop of that folding white thing. You know, the, yeah. the white. You know, backdrop. it's funny. It's like it's like Don Lamont's people like tipped the sky cap and they brought his drums, and now every drummer in Europe yeah. is playing. <laughs> Don Lamont's There's yeah. Drum set. I also have a good photo here of, of Roy Haynes playing that same drum kit. Here you can really see very clearly, actually, that it's a white marine pearl floor tom. Yeah. Um, and look, that's the same symbol. I, I mean, you look at that, that symbol and you look at the picture of Don Lamont playing, looks to be the same symbol. And then that photo of Tony at Newport 66, uh, sorry, 67. I'm pretty sure that's, I'm pretty sure that's Don Lamont's stuff. Again, that symbol... I'll I'll just this is a little reveal. We're gonna do a whole symbol episode, but let's just do this right now. Take a look at 1967 Stockholm Five. You see a nice close up of that symbol. This is a, a screenshot from that video um, of the Miles Quintet in Stockholm, 1967. Tony playing Don Lamont's drums, and that I mean. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm a vintage symbol expert. There are people that know a lot more about this stuff than me, but I'm pretty good at identifying symbols. I have vintage A's. I have vintage K's. I would put my life on that being an A Zildjian. It's not a K. That The lathing, the bell shape especially, that just screams A Zildjian to me. The flatness of the top of the bell it's just it's very distinctive so yeah. we will get to that properly in the symbol episode but um there's some other backline kits i want to show you that he played on this um european tour um when they were in italy he played a hollywood kit which is a an italian brand um and i believe in milan he is playing this kit let's look at 1967 hollywood 2 He's playing this kit with sort of an oyster finish. I believe this, they play, I know they played in Milan and they played in a place in Italy called Lecco or Lecco. I don't know. I've never heard of that town. Um, you see, again, some different symbols. I don't know what these symbols are, but this is a Hollywood kit. It says clearly on it, Hollywood. Um, and then another night, now look at um, 1967 Hollywood Lecco 2. We have actually a Hollywood ad. This is a screenshot I took from Instagram. Um, somebody uh, runs a, um, a Miyazzi Hollywood hip drums uh, Instagram feed, which is a, a cool feed that everybody should follow. And totally. here yeah. is a great photo of <laughs> of not only Tony playing this kit, but they're actually kind of claiming that he's an ex <laughs> well, they're not kind of. They're it says Anthony Williams exclusive Miyazzi <laughs> artist, which he was not at all at the time. He no, was a like Gretsch you artist. Once, you're exclusive. <laughs> he was a Gretsch artist. He was still a Gretsch endorser at this time. He's still appearing in Gretsch ads and downbeat that is magazine. Funny. Wow. You know, he he was consistently a Gretsch endorser. But yeah, here we have him in Italy playing a this is a different Hollywood kit than the, the dark oyster kit yes. we just saw. Um, but what's really kind of amazing is, oh, and here is, we answered my question of who Sarah Vaughn's drummer was, Omar Clay. If we look below Tony, yeah. we see Omar Clay, exclusive, exclusive Miyazzi artist, trio Sarah Vaughn. Leco Which of Festival course he probably Divinez. wasn't. <laughs> probably wasn't. Don Lamond. <laughs> Festival, Newport Festival All-Stars. For whatever reason, Don didn't have his own kit on this gig. He played the the Miyazzi, uh, the, 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 um, 
the Hollywood, the, the Hollywood uh, drums. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and I have posted a video on Instagram and Facebook before of, I believe, Copenhagen 1968. Max Roach. Yes. A famous cool video of him playing the right. same oyster black pearl or black oyster pearl, whatever you right, want to call it. Right. Right. Uh, it's probably the same kit. Well, it could be, but Max actually was a Hollywood artist. That's Max true. Did, he actually did leave Gretsch and was yeah. a Hollywood artist for a while into the seventies before he joined Ludwig. Um, yeah. And, was and there's with cool Ludwig. promo pictures yes. with the console with the wheels That's and the, right. the bright pink colors and, and stuff. And he had the yeah. tunable, the pedal tunable floor, Tom. Yes. And the it's electronics. A, yeah. It's a yes, cool company. Right. It's very, yeah. very, very, very cool company. Very, very innovative and and ahead of their time, and came out with all kinds of cool things that that some of them, you know, were were influential, and some of them just didn't really go anywhere. But they they just tried a lot of stuff, yeah. and you know, I guess yeah. I mean, Tony played those drums in Italy, and we have at least two kits. This one here in the ad that's kind of a white finish. Um, so let's see, what else do we have? Um, there's Another photo, I just have it as 1967, maybe Ludwig backline. Now, this is not from the same tour. And the reason I know is because every other photo of them on this 67 Europe tour, um, the whole band is wearing tuxedos except for Miles. And in this photo, Tony's wearing what looks like maybe a tan suit. Mm -hmm. um, but he's playing a Ludwig kit. He's got a Ludwig, um, you can see a Ludwig snare. Um, and you can see a Ludwig floor tom as well. Now, I don't think this is the same kit as we see, you know, that burgundy kit. Burgundy. That we see. Yeah, because he's not. Well, you know what? Jeez, maybe it is. Maybe it is because, I mean, he's wearing a different suit. He's, you know, in the, the earlier photo where he's playing the burgundy kit in 66 at Newport, he's wearing a dark colored suit. In this photo, he's wearing a light colored suit. But, you know, maybe maybe they played a couple shows and maybe change suits. Maybe they were there two nights. I don't know. It's possible. It looks actually like a similar um, Mike boom stand above yeah. the drums, but Tony is definitely in a different outfit. So I don't know. Um, there's mm. some other back line from this period. Um, oh, there's a good one from London. Um, 1967, October London. So they, the Miles Davis Quintet played in London on October 29th, 1967. And the photos, there are a couple of photos from that concert. And Tony is playing a very cool looking Ludwig, um, what looks to me to be blue oyster pearl. It's definitely an oyster pearl kit. It looks like blue because it's a little lighter than what you typically see, you know, like Ringo's kits, black and white photos of Ringo's kit. The black oyster looks darker than this. So um, I guess it's possible it's a pink oyster, but so this kit is a larger Ludwig kit. It's a 13 inch rack tom and a 16 inch floor tom. And I can't actually tell if that's a 20 or a 22. So there's a second photo um, from London um, where you see Miles and Ron Carter. And because of the lug spacing on the bass drum, I'm pretty sure that this is a 22 because we see three lugs on one side and we're not halfway down. We're, we're, we're about halfway down. If it was a 20 with eight lugs, you would see a greater space between the sort of second and third lug. So I'm pretty sure this is a 22. Um, and, and 13, 16, 22 kits were much more common for Ludwig than uh, 13, 16, 20s were. We also see there's a an unused um, cymbal holder on the bass drum that's sort of at a weird angle there that he's not using. He's using a regular cymbal stand. Um, you see that in both of these photos. Pretty good backline kits, though. I mean, they're they're there's we've all played much much worse backline. Uh, it's kits. funny these you say nice. that because I don't have any photos of it, but there's a video. The other the other film of this band from this tour is from. Um, let me see. It's from um, Germany. It's from uh, Karlsruhe. Um, so my, my wife, who speaks fluent German, um, informs me that it is a Karlsruhe uh, or something like that. Um, but it's, it's so November 7th, they played in Germany somewhere. And um, there's video of it. I don't have photos, but there's there's video you'll see on YouTube. And he is playing a, uh, a premiere kit. 
and and it's it's a pretty gnarly kit. I have to say, it doesn't sound as good. It sounds kind of thin. It's got those Premier Everplay heads that might be sort of like not even coated heads, and it's just not the best. And you can see that the cymbal stands and the hi hat stand are all moving a whole lot. Um, it's it's not on a rug or anything, so everything's sliding around, and and that is actually I think Tony sort of struggling to 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 you know deal with this um, not so good backline kit. Um, yeah. One other kit to show you that I don't know where this is from. This is from a CD, um, a bootleg CD of the band in Belgium, but I don't necessarily think that this photo is from Belgium. Um, but it's on the same tour. And uh, this is this is a funny kit. It's another Oyster um, Ludwig kit, but it's a different one than the. the I, originally, I thought this was just another photo from London, um, but the photos from London, you can see that the uh, the the rack tom is on a rail mount, and in this photo, um, he's the 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 rack tom is on a snare stand, same size as thirteen, sixteen, twenty two, and we also have basically a piccolo snare drum another odd thing about this kit is that i don't see a hi-hat and oh, yeah, this is one right. of these things with backline sometimes you show up and boy the guy forgot to bring a hi-hat stand or the hi-hat stand broke and it just he can't be used so it looks that Yikes. like tony played a gig here maybe without a hi-hat stand at least for for the, at the point when this photo was snapped we don't have a In hi-hat the- stand Bottom, bottom right before the white. Is there a little something of a leg I think coming that's out? The, I think that's the throne he's sitting on. Oh, I think you're right. I think that's the base of okay. the throne. I thought that no. too, but but no, yeah. I think that's I think that's the throne. No, um, I had. So yeah, that's basically what we have. Oh, one other um, one other thing to go through with backline kits. There are a couple others that are um, worth noting. Um, there's a photo shoot. So let's look at the folder called other backline kits. There's a photo shoot he did for an album. Um, he, he recorded an album with the great tenor saxophonist named Charles Lloyd. Um, it's a really great album called Of Course, Of Course with um, uh, Gabber um, Zabo on guitar and Ron Carter on bass. And there are a couple of promo photos that have somewhat recently surfaced, nice um, color uh, in-studio photos. And he's playing this sort of strange um Gretsch kit that I don't think that Tony owned because I've never seen any other pictures of him playing anything like this but it's a red sparkle kit no rack tom just a 20 inch bass drum and a 16 inch floor tom there's the uh, 4160 snare it's possible this was Tony's own snare but it could have also just been with the kit and we have a ride cymbal and hi hats the hi hats look like they're on a premier hi hat stand oddly and the snare stand is some sort of very large bass snare stand um and i think this is just some oddball kit that was kind of thrown together for this photo shoot um but it is still pretty cool always cool to see tony on gretch um another interesting one that recently surfaced on um facebook if we look at 1963 monterey um tony sat in with a group um that was sort of a trad jazz group, a Dixieland type group with Pops Foster on bass. Um, and he sat in, um, he didn't play the gig, but I don't know who the drummer was, but we see a, a very, very young um, Tony Williams sitting in on somebody's Camco drum kit, uh, which is pretty cool looking. Another really interesting photo that, that uh, popped up on, I believe on Facebook, not too long ago, is um, I had mentioned before in the previous episode about how Tony did this um, tour of Japan with Elvin Jones and Art Blakey, this sort of drum extravaganza tour in 1966. Yep. Well, apparently when he was in Japan, he got some sort of hookup with Yamaha drums. When Yamaha were just sort of starting out making drums, um, he appeared in a Yamaha ad, very similar to the uh, the Hollywood ad that we see. Now, he was still a Gretsch endorser, um, yeah. but, you know, I think maybe endorsements were in some ways a little looser or maybe people figured, oh, well, nobody's going to ever find out that I, you know, agreed to 
you know, appear in an ad in Italy or in Japan, you know, like sure. Gretchen isn't going to find out, you know. So he's apparently in some sort of Yamaha ad that we see here, him playing these early. I don't know that much about these this era of Yamaha. There's some guys that are experts in this this Yamaha era, but it's a pretty cool photo of, of Tony yeah, playing a, a Yamaha bop kit in the late 60s. Um, awesome pres- finish. Uh, yeah, great finish. Now, I assume this photo was taken in 1966 when he was there for this drum battle. Um, now, a couple other funny backline photos. There's there's um, this one. Um, uh, the, the, he played at the Newport Jazz Festival in 1972. There was a Newport held in New York. This is a photo of him playing a yellow kit, but this I'm almost 100% certain is him actually sitting in on Elvin's drum set. Now he's playing double drums with Art Blakey. And um, this kit, I as I said, there are a, a lot of photos of Elvin playing a kit identical to this. It's, it's a Gretsch yellow kit, 12, 13, um, probably 16 and 18 floor toms and 18 inch bass drum. It's uniquely Elvin because it has, um, you can see curved spurs on the bass drum. Elvin's kit, this era kit had um, uh, Camco spurs added to it. Um, there's something very unique about the placement of the badge on the second rack tom that again matches with a million photos of Elvin. Also, you see um, three 20 inch symbols, um, two of which have rivets, which is a Elvin signature and not a Tony thing at all. So, mm. you know, Elvin was on this festival. I'm pretty sure that that's Tony sitting in on Elvin's kit and not actually Tony's kit. Um, there's another little backline photo from 1977, the trio of Doom, which was an all star group of John McLaughlin on guitar, Jaco Pastorius on bass, and Tony. Apparently there's this photo of them rehearsing and Tony is playing probably the drums that were in the rehearsal studio, which looks like a uh, a Ludwig kit in Silver Sparkle with the front head off and a big towel shoved in the bass drum. See, this is exactly why those later Gretsch bass drums had those internal supports so that sure. you wouldn't have a drum. You can almost, I don't think it is, but you can almost sort of see how a drum would start to sag if you didn't oh, yeah. have that support happening on the shell. The weight of it, yeah. Yeah. Now, there's a very funny backline photo. from. It's from the 80s, apparently. Um, he's got his red jumpsuit, but he's playing this really sad-looking Rogers kit from the 60s. And yeah. I don't know what happened here with that second Tom, but it's just it just looks like a backline nightmare to me. It may it, maybe it's falling off, but this is what you see in like a catalog <laughs> where they're like drum set and they're completely you oh, know what I mean like a kid's yeah, catalog. But exactly, it could be yeah, sliding it like, off. Yeah, it could be, or I mean, who knows? Yeah, and and, and like the, the mic is like touching I the was front head. Say that that's just there's so many you know just and what a good sport tony is to just go ahead and just play this kit you know but but man what what a what a nightmare backline kit another interesting one from the 80s is a, a photo of him playing a nice yamaha recording custom kit um very nice again maybe he was just sitting in on someone else's gig um the angles don't quite look right for tony but you know whatever i mean he's it's yeah, but it's a unique another a second photo of him playing Yamaha, I guess, which is an he looks uh, thing. he looks blissful playing that one. His face yeah, is very well, uh, he looks happy. He does look happy. You're right. Yeah. Well, he, he I'm sure he was swinging, and yeah. he was probably playing with some other bad dudes. So um, for sure. Now there are a couple of interesting photos of him in the '80s uh, or '90s playing. A, playing backline kits. So let's look at um, not the studio session, but these other two photos. The first one, 80s, 90s backline, where he's playing a Gretsch kit that looks to be his sizes, 13, 14 rack toms, but these are power toms. And yes, it looks like are. a dark, you know, either walnut finish or a rosewood finish, one of those great dark Gretsch lacquer finishes. But this is obviously not his kit. It's a, a you know, power tom backline kit. He's also got a boom stand on his uh, left-hand symbol, which he normally wouldn't have had. You know, he normally always used straight stands, except for the sure. the the symbol holder um, for the middle symbol. Now, there's another photo, which I initially thought, this is also a Power Tom kit in a dark lacquer finish. And I kind of thought originally it was the same kit, or, or at least from the same gig, but we see a straight symbol stand on his left. We don't see a boom stand. We see um, he does actually have his um, middle symbol, 
mounted on the little boom stand off of the uh off the tom mount so i don't think this is the it, it, it's possible it's the same kit maybe you know but it's a different date it's a different you know so different hardware anyway and it looks to me like he's got his own yellow snare drum there because that snare drum looks lighter in that photo this is the black and white photo we're looking at yep. and then one last backline photo i found that's pretty interesting is is um tony in a recording session um I don't know who that is standing behind him, though. It may have been his tech at the time, or it may have been a recording engineer. And again, it looks like they sourced the right sizes for Tony. It looks like some big rack toms, but it's not yellow. It's definitely not his kit, but it also appears that everything is mounted possibly on one of those pearl drum racks that like Jeff Porcaro used. Yeah, Coming right. in from the front. Exactly, yep. yeah. And the toms are on pearl... Uh, Tom arms and they're also on rims mounts. Um, he's got pearl uh, uh, boom stands that the symbols are coming off of. So that's kind of a unique setup. Something I don't know what record this could have been, but some recording date where he wasn't able to bring his own drums. But yeah, that just about does it for backline, and we covered a lot there. I like to point all of that out because I don't, I, I don't like the idea of somebody seeing because I've made this mistake before myself. I see a photo of somebody playing what I don't realize is a backline kit and think like, oh, well, Tony Williams used a Ludwig Burgundy sparkle drums, you know, and, and he didn't, that's a, that's, it's a, it's just a common, or twice yeah, just or once, week or whatever. right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or Tony yeah. played this, um, white satin flame kit or, you know, the, I, I don't, you know, those, I mean, I, I, that kit, the white satin flame kit is clearly Don Lamont's kit. We have photos of that fo of, of that kit with Don Lamont's, um, you know, yeah. the name on the front bass drum head. So, yeah. you or, know, I oh, just, he's, he's endorsed by Hollywood drums. Exactly. It yeah. In print. Yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, I <laughs> yeah. think it's important to, to just kind of point some of these things out and clarify no, where, where something seems to be, you know, a backline kit versus something that he owns. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I mean, so that basically wraps up uh, part two. Yeah. So uh, Paul is going to come back on and we're going to do one more recording for this round. And it's going to be part three, which will be symbols, sticks, yes. hardware. I mean, we talked well, about we talked about the hardware. I think it's going to be simple sticks and heads heads. That's and, right. Um, heads. Yeah. I mean, yep. there's not much to talk about with the heads, but we will talk about it. Um, and yeah. Um, I have one photo that shows Tony's drum cases, so we can talk about his cases as well. I think but, I might but, have seen that. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah where it says I, Anthony on the front or something like that. Oh, I don't know. Of, well, let's. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we'll there's see. there's more to the mystery. Yeah, yeah. But but uh, the big story, of course, is going to be symbols. That's that's you know yep. Tony's symbols are literally the stuff of legend. So um, there's a lot to cover there and a lot to talk about and. Um, a lot of yep. influence to be had. I mean, it's just this this guy is he's just such an it's it's really hard to overstate. It's impossible to overstate how incredibly important Tony was and is and how influential um, he continues to be. And, you know, I, I have students that were not born when Tony was alive that are massively influenced by him. And I think it'll yep. continue to be like that. And, and I just think that's a wonderful thing. And he's just such a, such a wonderful, amazing drummer and musician. And I, I'm really happy to be able to, to pay this little tribute to him and super just geek out on his gear and, you know, Definitely. just try to try to get people, you know, I mean, it's fun to talk about his gear, but, you know, everybody really should be going out and, and listening to Tony Williams as much as possible. Listen to the records with Miles, listen to his solo records, listen to Believe It and Emergency and um, Native Heart and all of these. I mean, it's just so much great music. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what absolutely. It's, that's what it's about. First off, Paul, thank you very much for doing this again. You're and we're we'll very welcome. We'll we'll do it uh, for part three, and then we'll get um, Garrison on as we get that scheduled and everything. And and as a reminder to people, if you're listening to this like in real time as they're coming out, and you just want more Paul in your life, <laughs> go back and check out the Neil Peart series. That's a three parter that three did parts. very well, and people love that. And uh, and it was it was amazing. So that's that's other stuff with Paul. There are some other Tony Williams episodes that I did about a biography. With yeah. uh, Dave Goodman, which is awesome. There's um, a clinic breakdown with Rob Hart. Check the description. Um, but I appreciate everyone watching. And 
stay tuned for part three. We'll yeah. be back for the symbols and the heads and the sticks. And then after that, we'll get we'll get Garrison on for part four. But uh, before we end, real quick, right now, Paul, is there anything you want to you want to plug in case someone is just watching this one Ooh. for the first time? Um, well, actually, yeah, I uh, one of the bands that I play in is um, Vince Giordano's Nighthawks, which is a uh, um, uh, band that specializes in early jazz music, nineteen teens, nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties, and we were um, absolutely uh, just very, very lucky and blessed to appear in the latest Martin Scorsese movie, um, which just came out, Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, it's, I have not seen it yet, but by all accounts, it is an absolute masterpiece. Um, it You're seems like it. it's gonna, yeah, yeah, we're in it. So we did some music for it and then we're actually invited to participate on screen performing some of the music that we recorded. Um, we do a lot of soundtrack work, but, um, this is an opportunity to actually appear on screen and we appear now it's a very long movie. It's over three hours long. And if you make it all the way through, we actually appear in the very, very last scene. There's a there's a sort of an epilogue to the to the story that happens at the very end, and we are apparently prominently on screen throughout this this end scene. So um, you will see me. I actually um, because men didn't shave their heads in those days. The movie mostly takes place in the 20s. This epilogue, I think, takes place in the 40s. Men didn't shave their heads, so I actually had to grow my hair out. Um, for this shot and I had to shave my beard because beards weren't really in in those days so you Mm. might not recognize me but I it is me there Um, I'm playing some um, uh, 1930s era Gretsch drums and some timpani and some other crazy things we're playing this sort of quasi orchestral piece so um, if you see Killers of the Flower Moon which you should because it's apparently an amazing movie and a really uh, powerful story at the very end you will see me playing some drums and hear me because that is that is payoff. us that is us playing um, <laughs> on the soundtrack as well. We weren't just miming, so uh, wow. yeah, that's uh, yeah the payoff of the movie. I'm I'm sure that when it wins lots of Oscars, it's going to be because of our yes. participation. <laughs> oh. Man, I didn't. I had no idea. That is incredible. Well, congratulations, man. Thank that you. is uh, thank you. That is very cool. That's awesome. So I'm, I'm a big. Uh, I, uh, I want to see it. Yeah. I'm a big Scorsese fan, and it's absolutely. I mean, it's an unbelievable honor to be in any way involved with something that he did. So it's it's. I'm really. Uh, I did also play. I mean, not to plug my stuff, but but the, his previous film, um, the the Irishman. Um, I, I did a lot of soundtrack work on that. Oh, cool. Um, I like so that. So you can hear me. Yeah, it's a good movie. Um, you can hear me on that. Uh, and I'm I am in the credits at the end. Um, but but this is one where I'm actually on screen with the band. So, um, super and, cool. Yeah. So check that out. And if you're in New York, speaking of Vince Giordano's Nighthawks, we play, we have a residency uh, at Birdland, um, the fantastic jazz club in Midtown Manhattan. We play every Monday uh, at Birdland. Um, uh, It shows at 5.30 and 8.30. Um, So if anybody is in New York City, um, come out to see us. It's a really fun uh, gig. When I'm in town, I I do miss it sometimes when I'm out on the road with Curtis Tigers. But when I'm in town, I'm always there on Mondays. So check that out. Very nice. And be sure to tell Paul, hey, I saw you on Drum History Podcast Uh, or that other Martin Scorsese guys movie. You can mention (laughs) that too. But uh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Marty something. I don't know. I forget. Marty whatever. Bart's yeah, the so. real story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that Neil Peart series, man. Screw the I, movie. A lot of people have been um, actually writing to me, and, and I, I've had people come up and say that they watch the Neil stuff, and, and um, that's been extremely cool. rewarding and, and, and really nice that people have seemed to, to really enjoy that series. So thanks to nice. Bart for making Absolutely. it happen. Oh man, you're, you're you're the star of uh, star of the show. So um, no, Neil's the star right, of the well, show. Neil and Tony are the true. stars of these shows. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we're just the uh, uh, you know the carriers of the information, and uh, we're we're uh, just the narrators. The just the narrator. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, Paul. Well, uh, this is awesome, man. I appreciate your time on this one, and I will see you on part three. Can't uh, wait. And yeah, thanks to everyone for listening. Be sure to subscribe. And like this, and it'll pop up on your feed, and you'll stay in the loop, and uh, all that good stuff. So, Paul, thank you for being here. All right. Thank you, Bart. Take care.